Right, so welcome all. Uh, this is the second uh, chapter of um, Python stuff that we'll be going over. Uh, I trust y'all can join my stream and see. Um, so you can just yeah join the stream to see the slides and the demo that I'll be doing. Demos, that is. And so yeah, we'll be talking about um, the use of Python for data retrieval and data analysis. So, yes, uh, we're going to be using some modules for this. Uh, we'll be going over three Python modules specifically. Be going over the request module, beautiful soup four, and pandas. So uh, requests in of itself is uh, a module that allows you to do some RESTful interactions. So everything that is get, post, put, delete, uh, to an API and retrieve some form of JSON or XML. It's pretty standard um, nowadays. Um, what people also usually know is that when you query a web server, uh, you actually send a GET request. And what you're getting back is a response in the form of HTML. So you can actually use normal requests to just download web pages. Uh, and yeah, so basically it allows you to query the entirety of the internet. Um, and if you're using correct proxies, also uh, the dark web, if you're doing it correctly. Um, so you can get a ton of stuff, most notably status codes, response content, headers. The interesting stuff is usually in the content, but sometimes in the headers, uh, depending on if you have authentication uh, tokens, stuff that's left there. Um, could be interesting. So I have a small demo for you, uh, and the demo gods today will be nice. I've decreed that they would be nice. And since it's Python, I really don't see why they wouldn't be nice. So um, I have a directory. So first of all, I'm going to set up something uh, so that you know. So uh, first of all, that is not the right window. I use Poetry as a uh, environment, manager, uh, environment management system, which means that for the moment, uh, my environment Right, literally has no dependencies. I have nothing in it. Uh, I'm going to need to change that because requests, pandas, and beautiful soup are modules, so I need to install them. What I'm going to do right, is uh, I'm going to go to my command prompt, uh, poetry add, right, and it's going to be uh, bs4 for beautiful soup4 requests, so requests lxml as an optional dependency of pandas that we're going to need and pandas so what this is going to do it's going to create a virtual environment and it's going to download all these packages and add them that way we can use them um, this is pretty standard um, dependency management you can do this with any virtual environment the reason why i'm doing it this way is that in that case it won't um, mess up anything because I have an entire virtual environment for just this. So it does a little bit of clutter on my hard drive, but it's perfect for us. NumPy is going to take a second to install. Um, and now we are getting to pandas. So once that is done, I'm going to launch a Python shell and we'll be able to start uh, using requests. LXML getting there, and pandas. Give it a second. Give it one more second. Give it a few seconds. Sorry for the terribly interactive content. Uh, you're currently watching a terminal. Take more time than it's supposed to. The demo gods. Right. By the time this is done, ah, requests, and there we go. Now we're done. Uh, so I'm going to run my uh, my Python shell. So poetry run Python. Right. So I now have a Python 3 shell. This is going to be useful. So first what I'm going to do is I'm going to request any website on the internet. So I'm going to first import requests, pretty standard. And I am going to, I, I already scoped out a um, data source. Uh, it might not be the best data source, but it's at least one that I know works. And uh, as an example, I'm going to show you what it is. 
Uh, so it's on the web archive. It's literally um, has to do with uh, reported crimes and imprisonment rates. The, the main utility for this is that it has tables in it, and that's what I wanted. I didn't spend 50 hours searching for stuff. So in that, you are, uh, in that URL, um, you'll notice, well, it's a fully-fledged URL, which means I can do a GET request on it. So that is as uh, simple as just doing request.get and your URL. It's going to take a second. And as you can see, um, the request succeeded. So it's a status code 200. Um, if you sometimes have a, an issue remembering what a status code does, I have a very good resource for you. It's called http.cat. And then you can just type in your status code and it tells you what it is. That's a, a fun little factoid. Um, <laughs> so we have a status code, but we also have content. And our content is going to be long, so I'm just going to trim it a little. Right, and you can see this is an HTML file. Uh, it says, you know, doc type HTML public blah. Now, something you might not be used to in um, Python or anything is this B. As B is a little bit uh, problematic, it's basically your string is encoded on more bytes than usual. And so we have a way of dealing with that. But first, let's just save this file to uh, something else, to another just save this content of a file to an actual file. So what we're going to do is we're going to use another library. This one is by default uh, in, in Python. It's called Codex. Uh, it allows you to save files with um, well in with a certain encoding. In our case, uh, that would be UTF-8. So I'm importing the open uh, function, which is you know a default function of Python as the open because I might want to use open afterwards. So I can open a file. So C open, uh, let's call it data.html. Yeah. All right. And specify the encoding. UTF-8. There we go. That opens up a file. I can now write r.content. Now r.content, as, uh, as I specif uh, said before, you know that you have this B thing. We're going to want to decode that. And the way we do that is we just pipe it to decode and write in UTF-8 as well. Right, f.close, so that saves the file. Now, if I were to go to my WSL and just nano data.html, you can see that we have an HTML file now, uh, which is, you know, for the crime and punishment, 1978 to 2012. And once again, we can see some tables here, and that is what is going to be interesting us today. So, yep, uh, what we just did right there was just copy some data from the internet and download it. It's not exploitable as of yet. And this is where we get to part two. Uh, we get to beautiful soup four. Beautiful soup four, beautiful soup four, sorry. I, I was eating my words much like alphabet soup. That was not a pre-planned joke. Um, is a HTML parser, um, and one of the common exercises is writing a parser for things. Um, for HTML, it's chaotic and horrible, uh, so we're going to use some one that already exists. Um, in this case, beautiful soup for is very useful for web scraping. Web scraping is literally. You download a web page, and you try to find important inf information in it. Uh, it could be email addresses, it could be phone numbers, or it could just be tables of data. Uh, and those tables of data are then transformed in a form of structured data, which is what we're going to be working with today. So yeah, uh, copy tables, parse for email addresses, etc. And we continue on with the demo. I am going to find a way to make this not be the end of my terminal uh, or fail. Um, can I fail? No. Okay. That sucks. Um, I'm going to import a BS4 or beautiful soup from BS4. Beautiful soup. And I need to find a way to do this. Um, 
Nope, not that. Right. And I'm going to open up the soup. So soup is a representation of a file, right? Well, I can use uh, soup. I can use the content I just pulled down uh, because I haven't emptied my uh, my buffer yet. But since I kind of want to do this in another prompt because this one is getting crowded, I'm going to do that now. Uh, so here's another prompt. Just run Python. There we go. And now we do the same uh, BS4 import beautiful soup. Soup, right? From codex import open as the open. Um, and then we do right as the open. Uh, C open, we call the data.html. Yeah. Read encoding. Close. UTF 8. We continue. Dot read. And we'll just pipe this into. Uh, we'll just call this D. Right. As you can see, I have completely ruined the usefulness of me doing another page. Um. <laughs> So now I can just do soup uh, equals beautiful soup, and we can do it with D. That way. So now that we have that, we're going to want to eventually uh, find all of the tables in our content because there might be more. For that, we're just going to declare a table of tables, and we're just going to find all of the nodes called table because beautiful soup has this fantastic thing which allows you to find uh, nodes or you know yeah DOM nodes in an HTML file just based on their name so I would do in soup so soup being you know my content um dot find all and then table and I'm going to add this to tables there we go plus equals node. So if I were to look at my various tables, uh, we're going to take a look. Okay, table zero. We see some web archive stuff. Not very interesting because it downloads each of the tables, right? And so now we have each table in a different table, uh, in a different index of our list. Here we have something once more about web archive. Here we have some data for other links. Not interesting. Here we have some data about uh, just some failure to render. Uh, it's just a small T body with almost nothing in it. And then we have table four, which actually has data in it. This is where it starts to get interesting. Okay, so we're just going to keep a table. So table equals tables four, right? And we're going to try to extract the data from it, okay? I'm going to declare an array called data. I'm going to try to find every row in the table. Right? So table, uh, find all tr. Uh, and then I'm going to say that, OK, yeah, I want to find each of the uh, elements. Uh, so table elements. And so that would be td. So you have table row, and then you have table cell, um, which is a td. Right. And then I'm going to pipe stuff into data. So this one might seem a little bit uglier uh, than what you're, you know, what you might expect. Um, but I'll ask you to find. So I'm going to take the first one, which it would be a date, much like this. Yeah. I'm going to get text because otherwise it would give me like the entire line, which is not interesting. And I am going to do this for multiple. Uh, columns. Uh, I'm going to try to space them out as good as I can. Two dot get text. It's pretty straightforward uh, in this sense. And one thing that you're already asking yourself is, yeah, but it takes time. And we're going to see why that is and how to get around that uh, right afterwards. So what I've done is I've now created 
an element which has multiple things in it. There we go. Each element of my list has something in it. Now one thing you'll notice is that this table was badly configured. So if I uh, look at the first element, it's actually an entire list. And we don't want that. So we're just going to slice a bit, slice and dice a bit. And now we fixed it up a little bit. Uh, but we have another issue, um, is that we have this, these ones which are called your randomly propped in. So we're going to remove that as well. So gene data, let's just do a data two, which is another array, right? And then we're just going to do for the data, which is what we just had. And we're going to check that the first column isn't called year, because that is exactly what we don't want. So we do it like this. And then we just push it to uh, data two. Now data two, if we look at the, let's see, five first elements, you'll see that we have one, okay? That's weird. Oh no, I did data, data. Okay, there we go. Did I prank myself? Yes, I did. Sorry, my bad. Um, I made a mistake. This would be if D zero. There we go. Uh, data two, and then if we do data two, we now only have dates. Um, so date, number, number, number. Okay, fantastic. Um, but these numbers aren't really exploitable. You see, we have spaces and they're all strings. That sucks uh, a bit. So we're going to do this yet another way. And we're going to pipe everything in data two. Um, so I am going the roundabout way of doing this. There's uh, one-liners that do this quite nicely, but this isn't the point. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to take each element um, and convert them, right? So the first one is a year, so it's always going to be an integer. And the other ones are always going to be uh, flo floating point numbers. So we can just do this, spacing it out for legibility. Um, don't do this in actual code. Okay, and now if we look at data three, and we look at the three first elements, we now have a date, which is an int, and then three floats. Sounds awesome, right? Um, but it did take us all of this to get that, which is, as you may have noticed, not extremely efficient. Income pandas. Um, it's used for working on data uh, and sorting and filtering and stuff. So it is kind of the tank of data representation and analysis. And thank you, Aggie, for that sprite, which I am uh, casually using here. Uh, and it works with most file formats. Uh, like you wouldn't be able to pull um, a HTML or a table from a PDF file. But it'll work with uh, CSV, Excel, HTML, anything that actually has data in there. So that's kind of what we're going to be working with now. So how do we do that? Not by adding more space, evidently. Um, let's do this. Exit. DD desktop code do data. Yep. Okay. Poetry. Python, there we go. Okay, import pandas as pd. So this import might take a second, there we go. And now we're going to do the fun thing. Uh, is DFS or DF is the common abbreviation for data frame or data frames. And the reason for that is that pandas uh, and NumPy and a few other scientific libraries, let's put it that way, use data frames as a multi-dimensional structure to represent data. And it is quite powerful. And that's kind of what we're going to be looking at right now. So um, you remember our file, right, uh, data.html. Well, we could just read that, okay? 
data.html. Encoding equals ETF8, right? And assuming I didn't do this wrong, right? If I now look at DFS uh, zero, see that we have some random stuff. So we still have the same pages as before. Okay, but what happens if I do DFS four? We now have what we're looking at before. Okay, uh, same thing with the years and everything. Cool. So now what we can do is very simply, uh, first we're going to rename the columns because these are insane. Okay, so if we look at DFS5 maybe, yeah, this one is a little bit more interesting. We're going to rename columns. So uh, we can just do this in place. So df equals df rename columns. And this takes a dictionary. So we'll take what it is, which would be year in this case. Um, well, actually it would be zero um, because they didn't specify the heading yet again. So we're going to rename uh, column zero to year, uh, column one to inmates per 100K, two for a new index, this ought to be a string, um, star, three for index per inmates, uh, or at least I assume that's what it means. Um, it's there we go. This is yet again in the dictionary. We rename this, and if we do this, I forgot to set df to dfs5. There we go. Now, if I have df, I have this. Uh, now that's beautiful, except for the fact that we have these things with year in it. It's kind of whatever. Okay, so we're going to get rid of that. Um, first of all, we're going to we're going to work with the ones that don't have year, the text year, in the column year. So pandas works very well, and data frames work very well with a little bit of a fancy thing. If I do df, uh, df uh, and work on a column name, either by doing it you know, with the brackets or by doing it simply if it's a one word sentence. Well, one word element. Um, I can just do not equals year. Bang. We now have everything without a year, and this is our header. So just with one line, we've gotten rid of a ton of stuff without doing a for loop, without doing anything. This allows us to sort some stuff, which is a little bit nicer. Okay. Um, now, now that we have that, is okay. I'm going to actually do this and reassign this because I don't want to deal with years every time. We can do a ton of things. Uh, we could quite simply, uh, for example, do an average. Okay. Uh, do you think we could do an average? Um, let's do. Okay. Um, okay. Do do I have the average function here? Average one, two, three. Let's see if I have this. Okay. Uh, from math import. Average. Am I okay? Average. Uh. <clears throat> Sorry. This is ridiculous. There is a function, yes. Oh, from the statistics package. Yeah, we're not going to use that. We're going to um, use the normal thing. Um, so I'm just going to define a, a function for an average, right? Uh, data set. Yeah. Uh, right, and I'm just going to say uh, it is some data set divided by the length of the data set. And that is it, my average. Okay. So if I were to uh, try to find the average of all of this, well, first I could do, okay, um, inmates per 100K, right? Oops. So this gives me a set of data, okay? 
And if I were to do average of this, would that work? Probably not. Because one of the issues I have is that all of my text is still text. It is not numbers. So how do I deal with that? Um, well, uh, an easy way of doing it would just be to modify my average function. Um, that's not fantastic. We could do a map um, where we transform everything into numbers. So I think we'd be better off doing that. So let me just take this, okay? Map, and uh, this is some, this is a little bit of wizardry uh, called lambda functions. It's a way of declaring an anonymous function much like in JavaScript. Um, and the only thing we'll be doing with this is just transforming it to a float. Just a floating point number, okay? And what happens if I call average of this? Has no length. I need to transform this to list again. Python is weird sometimes. Okay, and the average we do have is 392.2. Uh, yes, pandas is not doing the conversion for me because in the data set, as we saw earlier, uh, all of the numbers are as space number space. So that's an issue of. Um, Yes, the pandas are lazy, and also the data set has been horribly set, uh, built up, which when you're do, uh, which is a perfect exam uh, example because when you're doing, you know, data analytics or working with data, a ton of your data is going to be misrepresented, and that's kind of what we're seeing here. So I have to tr manually transform this into numbers, which is a bit ridiculous, right? So uh, thankfully, I could potentially um, do something on each column and have it work. Oh, they do uh, if there's no spaces around that. So um, what uh, JMS53 quite notably pointed out is that pandas usually tries to automatically convert things to in integers or floats. And the thing is, that is true, but kind of as we're seeing in, uh, in our original setting, is that there's spaces around them. And pandas doesn't like that. Nothing likes that. So we we need to manually do this, and that's an issue with the data set, I guess. But uh, it's also an issue that you're going to have to deal with often when you're dealing with open source data sets. As things might mismatch, malformed. You might have a random X pointing in, uh, or X, Y, a number, something, and you won't know why, and you'll need to deal with that and not have it crash your entire script, especially not crash in production, hopefully. So, yeah, that is pretty much what we can do with, uh, let's say, pandas or anything. Uh, we could do much more. We could just eventually do the sum. Not that it's quite interesting. We could um, potentially compare data sets. Uh, not that we have data to compare with. Uh, but we could quite easily, let's say, if I were to... Um, Hmm. I think this might just be a, pipe, a fever dream of mine. But I think there is a way to compare to... Oh, no, because I can't do that because they're not numbers. See, this is where it gets uh, complicated. Like I could have potentially divided one column by another and added it in as a column. But since everything is a string, it's making things much more complicated. Um, if I were to work on another data set, um, a funnier data set, I will need to change windows, though. Uh, so give me a second. Uh, let's go here, desktop, code, and go to this, and let's use an actual uh, data set. Right, so uh, open in Windows Terminal. Let's do things with actual data. Okay. Poetry, run Python, there we go. So we have pandas here as well in this, uh, in this data set. Word, pandas, that's pd. And here we're going to work with a CSV file. 
pd. So pfs equals pd.read.csv. And data.csv. And then encoding the usual shenanigan of UTF-8. Because people put accents and language names. Okay. So first, let me see if the, um, okay if this is a data frame or if it's an array of data frames. Okay. Okay, so it is a, d a data frame. So I guess I could just rename this as df. Right. Yes, there we go. And here we have a data set uh, of actual data uh, people. Uh, it's anonymized, so there's no risk uh, risks here. Um, except, you know, age and gender and potentially country of residence. We're not going to get very far with that. But this is actual data. Um, so, for example, if I were just to do... Oh, yeah, let, let me just get someone's age. Okay. So, I could do df.age. Ha! Huh, there we go. If I wanted to do... Um, I'm going to redeclare my average function. Reg data set... And this is a return sum data set, len data set. Boop. Okay, and let me just do, uh, oh yeah, average. What is the average age? 31. And you see it seamlessly uh, integrates a, a um, what is bf.age? A panda series as an array. It knows how to transform it to work with normal array functions. So that's pretty nice. Um, let's do something a little bit more uh, interesting. Let's say we want a set, which is you know, unique elements, of df.gender. There we go. We have male, female, non-binary, prefer not to say. Perfect. Um... Okay, we, we also have some various things like distances, languages. Um, we have timestamps, which aren't very useful. Uh, but let's say I want everything from people over, let's say, random number 36. Okay, df, df.age, above or equals 36. Boom. And you can do these types of mini sub queries to reduce the size of your data set. And that's beautiful. If you see what I mean. Um, this has multiple advantages uh, because you could do some very fast analytics on this. Like there I have, um, okay, df, df.h. Can I potentially query this uh, gender equals? I think you can chain these. It's double equals. You can change uh, chain these, and you can do some pretty, 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 pretty interesting things with that. Uh, because, you know, I just chained two queries. I could potentially also ask. Okay, yeah. Um, well, I don't have all of these things because, well, yeah, there's a lot of space being taken. Let's say if I wanted to check the columns, um, name of the columns, right? I could do this. So this gives me a ton of columns. So this is from an actual form. Uh, you cannot use relational queries, uh, but you can quite easily pipe them into a database and use them, uh, you know, in the sense they're supposed to be used. Um, and so basically you have, uh, okay, this. And if you have things that are the same name, pandas is going to do a smart thing. And it's going to rename the second instance dot one, the third instance dot two, et cetera, et cetera. And that is going to help you differentiate which column is where. For example, here we have distance between language three and language four dot one. Beautiful stuff. Um, so that works. Uh, we could do some interesting stuff with this. Um, I know I did. Uh, and this is not... This is going to give you an example of something you could do in, um, say, in a data science environment. So I'm going to do bash uh, nano extractor.py. I said, eh, there we go. Um, we're going to go a little bit further into the rabbit hole. And we're going to look at how one could use this with, you know, 
data. So, where does the program start? Well, the program starts here. Uh, we kind of decided to say, hey, uh, how many languages do we have? So we have the column names. We also have which uh, distance column names are dependent on this. Um, because the form works like that, you go from one and it give, it branches out. So you need to, to actually account for that behavior. And then you read a CSV. So the, the CSV is the one uh, I was showing here. I could open this in Excel, or, but I will open this in Notepad. And this just is a horrible CSV of kilometers long, uh, but a very small one and useful one. And so once you have that, you decide on people, okay? You want to extract the people because what you do need uh, from them, even if you don't need their identity, you might need some social cues, social context. So what you'll do is you're going to grab maybe age, gender, uh, nationality, country of residence, level of education, and just and you're just going to make a data representation from it. Um, yeah. Um, so data representation, Python. Well, why not use a class? Okay. So we haven't gone over object-oriented programming in Python, so I will go very quickly about it. About it, and we'll dedicate another session to object-oriented programming in Python, because it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do or get right. Uh, but essentially, object-oriented programming is representing structures, well, yeah, things with properties and with functions, and putting them in some form, way, shape, or form that can be then, um, you know, linked to, queried, stored in an array, all that stuff. For example, if I were to create a person, I would give uh, an age, a gender, nationality, residence, education, which I somehow forgot to give a type. Then I would assign it internally. I would check for uh, whether or not it was uh, empty, uh, not a number or not a, not a string, or, uh, you know, give it the actual thing. And I would also declare some la uh, language and distances and potentially add languages at distances and then finally a representation so representation is just to show it in some shape way or form um so now that we have people we've represented all the people in our rows as you can see here we have a csv and one of the things um that we're going for here is we just want to iterate over all the rows for that we can just go over the iter rows uh, parameter, which it is going to pipe out the number of the row, so the index, right? And uh, the row itself as a dictionary. And that's what we're using here. Um, so now that we have that, we have the column names. We check where uh, people said that they didn't have another language. And then we find the number of languages they are looking for. And then we add those languages, which is yet another class. Whoops, kind of doing nano on me. Um, and this class is a language. Same thing, language, dialect, proficiency, familiarity. And string representation. There we go. Same jazz. Um, now, I might be speaking a bit, um, well, alien to you. Let me show you what we can do with this, okay? Right now, okay, I have an output and I can push that output to uh, a file. So that's what I did. Here we have file and we can just write this as an export, right? Output, close. Uh, is there a role? Yes, uh, if you go to roles, uh, you can sign up for ping for events and misc which is the one so we don't ping everyone. No. Um, and yes, and he's not even a recording, so why am I saying this out loud? My bad. Um, events and misc. Um, <clears throat> what can we do with this? Well, we can use uh, the log 
and we can like pump out a representation of a person. Okay, that sounds cool. Okay, you have age, gender, nationality, residence, education, various languages, which they themselves have a language, dialect, proficiency, familiarity. So we transform the CSV from any form, way, shape, or form, or size into a representation. Brilliant. Um, but that's not all. Let's go to here. We also have a representation in forms of a database relational, no, a graph database language. Here we create nodes named language, person, match, uh, and we, we, we build relations. And the thing that does at the end, and as you can just pipe it into, let's say, a graph database uh, platform, such as Neo4j, and then you can represent it as, for example, hey, a person that knows Spanish, English, Arabic, French, and these languages all have a certain linguistic distance. This is a very concrete example. Um, it's actually an example I'm working on right now, so it's kind of coming in quite nicely. Um, but it is, yeah, uh, and Python, doing this in another language as Python, or bash scripting it, or whatever, is a way to take a lot of time. Whereas here, we do, okay, some Python, it did take a while to do all this, but it then is reusable for all uh, subsequent iterations of the data. And it produces, yet again, a tangential, well, not tangential, um, right, so nano cipher dot output produces every time this. And all I need to do is copy cipher dot output. Is it less? No, it's cat cipher dot output into clip.exe. Welcome to WSL. And just paste and it failed well that's on me interrupted that's weird no um right so if i were to do this from an actual file editor because i'm not insane no matter what someone tells you tries to tell you um if i copy this and i were to just shove it in there it would work quite quickly and it's hands off. I don't need to have a script that adds it manually. I just have something that works. So this is um, right data analytics uh, kind of, yeah, it's, it's a gateway into data analytics and most uh, importantly data representation. So yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Any questions? Because I know I went quickly and I, touched on some things that weren't necessarily quite so known about. So if you do have questions, please feel free to uh, either speak up or, uh, you know, say hi uh, or write them in no mic. <laughs>